The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus said, in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he suddenly comes. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of the Lord. You, Lord. you may be seated. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, last week at our Advent festival, I began by asking you what kind of waiter you are, particularly when it comes to driving on 610. Whether you are a patient waiter, the type that waves everyone in front of you into the merge, a somewhat patient waiter, you might let one car in, but otherwise you keep close to that car in front of you, or whether you are an impatient waiter, the type that scoots to the front of the line and waits until someone takes pity on you or someone isn't paying attention and you cut in line in front of them. So let me ask. Did anyone's driving habits change this week? Seth did, <laughs> just Seth, all right. Well, in my car, I got called out several times on my driving, so hopefully there's some progress coming. We talked about waiting last week because today we enter the official church season of waiting. Today we enter Advent. So this week, I want to ask you a related question, which is what kind of sleeper are you? Here are your options. Option number one, your head hits the pillow and you are immediately asleep, waking the next morning feeling refreshed and ready to go. <laughs> People just laugh. <laughs> All right, option two, it takes you a bit to fall asleep, some tossing and turning, and maybe you get up once during the night, but for the most part, you're pretty solid. Not great, but solid enough. And here's option three, you know everything there is to know about the night. You know the shadows, the sounds of your neighbors, when your neighbors get home, the train schedule. You have analyzed the movement of your ceiling fan. <laughs> when you finally fall asleep, if you do, it is fitful. So those are the three on the table. Are there any other options before we vote? Those pretty much cover it. You can find yourself in one. All right. So option one, how many of you are the best sleepers on the planet? I'm impressed, it's quite a few of you, all right? Option two, how many of you are okay sleepers? Option three, how many of you are awful sleepers? And how many of you, it depends on the night, some nights are good, some nights are okay, some nights are awful? Eh, some of you, okay. My guess is there's probably a quality of life correlation depending on what kind of sleeper you are. For those who are excellent sleepers, chances are you are also more optimistic and energetic and eager and content and report feeling good feelings about life. For those who are awful sleepers, 
without aid, chances are that life feels harder. You feel more overwhelmed, and you are probably a bit more irritable. And if you move back and forth between the two types of sleep, you can probably track better days with better sleep. In fact, I was recently talking to a pediatrician who told me that before she tests for attention-related disorders or behavioral issues, now she first tests for sleep issues. That there is growing evidence that poor concentration and challenging behavior can actually be tied to poor sleep. Sometimes if they can fix the sleep disorder, then other things will fall into place. Not always, but I thought that that was interesting. Sleep has such an important place in our wellness. Often the better we sleep, the better our quality of life. So you would think that as the days grow shorter and the nights grow longer, as the cold seeps in, as Advent begins, that our faith would acknowledge these changes and invite us into deeper sleep and into a slower pace. To let our bodies rest more for these four weeks. To let our spirit settle down a bit. To let our sleep lengthen with the lengthening nights. To winter using the words of a book that Zion recently read together. To enter into a period of winter and rest and calm. After all, this is what the earth is doing beneath our, beneath our feet. It is resting. This is what animals are doing all around us, preparing to hibernate. So it makes sense that as we enter Advent, we would also be invited into deeper rest, deep waiting, pausing, slowing. But our gospel reading this morning is the exact opposite. It is telling us to stay awake, to stay alert, to get ready. Here are Jesus' words. Therefore, keep awake. He says, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, midnight, cockcrow, dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he suddenly comes. And what I say to you, I say to all, Jesus says, keep awake. As we step into this season of Advent, those are the words that greet us. Stay awake. Be watchful. The end is coming. Jesus is returning. You had better look busy. People of God. What do we do with those words? In a world where sleep and rest can feel elusive, what do we do with words that tell us to practice just the opposite? And more importantly, why? Why is Jesus saying this to us? Well, there is some context to this story that is important to understanding what Jesus is up to. Today's passage from Mark is referred to as the little apocalypse. What you might not know is that when these words pick up, Jesus and his followers have arrived in Jerusalem, and his disciples are marveling at the temple. Look at the large stones, they say. Look at the large buildings. But Jesus knows something that they do not, that within the week, he will be dead. He has arrived in Jerusalem to face his death. While the disciples are marveling at the temple, at the great glory of God, Jesus is preparing to die. And in doing so, but Jesus, hold on one second, I lost my place. And in doing so, Jesus is attempting to change the locus of what they are marveling at. It is not the temple that should be the focus of their worship, but Jesus. After all, the temple will be destroyed in a few years. So do not put your hope in things, Jesus seems to be telling them, not on things that will fall, buildings and empires, the moon and stars, the sun, the earth. All of these things will fail you every time. No, Jesus is saying, put your hope in me. Put your hope in the one who will be with you through all those trials and tribulations, who cannot be destroyed by death who, when you are at your most helpless, is the very embodiment of hope. He is telling them what we fundamentally all know to be true. This world is hard. Being a human is hard. And hard things are coming. That is part of the deal of living. Hard things will come. Don't be overcome by the hard things. Keep your eyes trained on me, 
No matter what comes, I am with you. This is what Jesus is saying. While today we read these words in Mark as a little bit scary, Jesus intended them as words of hope. No matter what comes, keep your eyes on me. Trust in me. When Jesus says, keep awake, I don't think he is telling them to never sleep, to constantly be on alert, to never let their guard down. I think Jesus is telling them to keep their trust in him. And here's the thing about trust. When we trust, deeply trust in God, when we trust that God is with us, when we trust that God is love, when we trust that God's love is made known in love and service and community, then everything changes. We begin to learn what it means to melt into the gracious love of God. We begin to learn what it means that not everything will go right in this world, but that in God, everything will be well. Trusting God is not the same as trusting circumstances. It's not calling things good that aren't good. Jesus is not making an argument about the will of God. But trusting God is the sense that in our deepest selves, God is present. And that no matter what life brings, God is present. And that even when life tries to destroy us, God is present. And if the sun darkens, and if the moon fails to give its light, and if the stars fall from the heavens, God is present. There is nothing in your life that is outside the bounds of God's love or God's presence. Even if it is awful and terrifying in this moment for you, even if you are at rock bottom, God is present. That is what this text is about. That is what Advent is also about. Martin Luther was quoted as saying, if the world were to end tomorrow, do you know this quote? What did he say? Today I would plant an apple tree. He didn't actually say that. <laughs> but Lutherans really like this quote because it is something that makes profound sense to people who are grounded in God's love. We are loved and held in God, full stop. Even in the hardest periods, full stop. Which means that the question for us becomes, as our capacity allows, what might we do to lighten the load of those who journey with us? If the world were to end tomorrow, what might we do today? Perhaps donate a coat. Perhaps bring cans to the food pantry. Perhaps buy a, go a goat for the developing world. Perhaps give your time to someone in need. Perhaps write a letter to someone who is lonely. Or perhaps go to sleep tonight, resting in the deep assurance of God's love Perhaps trust in God's good rest. If tonight finds you staring at the ceiling, unable to sleep, thinking about all the things, well, you should make an appointment with your doctor. <laughs> but in the meantime, let yourself relax into the love of God. Keep your eyes on Jesus, which means trust in the one who holds you as you stare at the ceiling fan, who will be with you through all things. So get some sleep, for God will watch for you through the night. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>